Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Markov Processes. How is it going? Everybody doing good today? We were talking about recurrent and transient states last time. And a recurrent state for a Markov chain is one such that if you start at it, you will return with probability one. OK, and a transient state is one that you will return to with probability less than one. But I think it's easier to think of as you will escape with a positive probability, a probability greater than zero. And so the reason we're talking about these is because we're trying to get back to this idea of a limiting distribution of a Markov chain. And I was about to prove something, but started into an aside. So uh, let me start there and then uh, we can start that proof all over again without interruption. So my aside was the geometric distribution. This is one of the well-known named discrete distributions in probability. And the scenario is we have a sequence of trials of an experiment and they're independent. So a sequence of independent trials of some experiment. And each trial can result in one of two possible outcomes and we usually call them success or failure. And we assume that the probability of success remains the same from trial to trial, and we call that probability P. And we're going to let this little lowercase p, P, be the probability of success on any one trial. So we're going to let a random variable x be the number of failures before the first success. And if you are thinking, don't you mean the number of trials until the first success? You wouldn't be wrong. These are both called the geometric distribution. And we're going to need both of them at some point. But I'm going to start with this one because this is the one we need today. So the number of failures before the first success. So if you imagine just you know looking at your trials, uh, failure, 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 success, you know, and counting that, you'll you'll realize kind of quickly that x can take on the value zero because you can have success right off the bat, or it could take on the value one, two, three, and there's actually no upper bound. So this, this can take values uh, 0, 1, 2, on up. And last time we were looking at the probability that x equals some little x. In other words, the probability mass function. Um, and so we were going to do it by uh, a little, just, I don't know, just build it up. Um, the probability that x is 0 is the probability of success on the first trial. And this is just little p by definition. The probability that x is 1 is the probability of failure on the first trial and success on the second. And because the trials are independent, we get to break this up into a product of probabilities. And the way this is set up, the experiment doesn't care what trial we're on. The success probability is always p, which makes the failure probability always 1 minus p. So this is 1 minus p times p. Let's do one more before generalizing it. If we want to see exactly two failures before the first success, this is going to be the probability of a failure, then a failure, then a success. So here I held out one extra step before getting that lazy. But this is really failure on the first trial and failure on the second trial and success on the third trial. And by independence, you get to break these up. And if I wasn't so lazy, each one of these would give the trial number, but then we'd realize it doesn't matter. And so this becomes 1 minus p times 1 minus p times p or 1 minus p squared times p. And so it's not hard to see, especially you know, if you don't see it yet, write another one. But the probability that x equals some, some k is going to be 1 minus p to the k times p. And the allowable k's here, I don't know why I started with an x. I didn't. I just said it. Um, so k can be 0, 1, 2, on up. This is one of two types of geometric distributions. 
usually people write X squiggly line, which means has the distribution and then like a geom for geometric and then a P for that parameter. Uh, because there's two, I like to write, I will tell you every single time I write this, so you don't really need to know this. This is not notation you'll ever see in the world, but I like to put a subscript zero on the, on the geom word to say, this is the one that starts from zero. Um, but again, I'll, I'll try to say that every time I write it. So no one else is going to use that little subscript zero. Because um, I guess we should just get back to Markov and not talk about the other geometric. But the one that starts from one has a very similar looking PDF. But this starts from one, and this is k minus 1. And today, we're going to need the expected value of this geometric. So the expected value here. For any expected value, this is going to be the sum over all of the states. Um, K, X, I don't know what I should use. I'm going to use X. I think that looks more natural in an expectation of X times the probability that X equals X. And so in this case, this is the sum of X times 1 minus P to the X times P or that sum could have been over k, and we could have kept everything in terms of k. So let's sum this up. I am going to do a couple of things in one shot here. First of all, because when x is 0, this is 0, I'm going to now start this from 1. It's the same sum. At the same time, I'm going to pull the p out front. So this is p, the sum as x goes from 1 to infinity, x times 1 minus p to the x. I don't know about you, but the only sum I can ever remember is the good old geometric sum. And this is not it because of the x out front. But um, let's let's get it to look like that. So uh, in the end, in this course, and I'll remind you as an exam comes up, um, you're only going to need to know two sums. And that is a, a geometric sum. And I'm just muting a tab here. And the sum that defines, or the Taylor series expansion for E, we'll talk about it when we get there, but you're not about to launch into having to know a lot of sums. Anyway, to get this done, I'm going to call that 1 minus P something else. I'm just going to call it Q, make this a little more compact. And then I'm going to take a, a Q outside of the sum. And when I do that, the thing inside looks like a derivative to me. So I've got p times q. So I should have written maybe on the side where q equals 1 minus p. That's how it's defined. And then I have the sum from 1 to infinity of the derivative with respect to q of q to the x. And here, let me put this over here for the record. q is 1 minus p. And I'm going to pull the derivative out of the sum. Can you do that for an infinite sum? Only if both of them converge, but I don't want you worrying about that stuff in this course. I just don't want you. It's certainly important, but I, I want you to really focus on the Markov stuff and a little less on this stuff. Um, I'm never going to give you, uh, I'm never going to try to trick you and say, aha, you could not have interchanged those or, or pulled it out. But yeah, you're right. I know some of you are thinking, justify that. But I'm going to leave it in here. And so now, if you write this out with the different x's, you've got q plus q squared plus q cubed. And however you think about that, I personally re-index it to start from 0 to think about a really nice geometric. But I'm not going to drag you through all of my little personal quirks on this. So however you think about your geometric sum, this is q over 1 minus q. And we need to take its derivative. So quotient rule, I'm going to take the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. And everything is canceling out of that numerator. So I get p times q over 1 minus q squared. But p is 1 minus q. So this will cancel with one of these. I get q over 1 minus q. And putting it back to the p notation, we have 1 minus p over p. So that is the mean or expected value for this particular geometric distribution. If uh, you were taking the uh, 
if we were in an exam, you won't have to remember that. Um, it's going to be closed notes, but I will be, and, and no cheat sheet, but I will be providing you a sheet with formulas that you might need. And when we get close to the exam and I give you review problems, I'll also give you that sheet so you'll know exactly what you'll have. But that's the review we needed on the geometric. So I'm going to assume everyone is okay, unless you tell me otherwise. There's just one more thing before we launch into finding the expected number of returns to a transient state of a Markov chain. And that is an indicator notation. If you've taken math stat with me, or if you've been in one of the classes that have used my notes or my book, um, you'll know I'm really big on indicator functions. Not so much in Markov because it's just not as important for the calculations we do. What I'm about to write here is not an indicator function, um, but an indicator. So I, I don't want you to write this down, but just in case anyone has already seen this and is confused, usually we define some set A and we have a function that you might call I sub A of X. And that is gonna be defined to be one when X is in A and zero otherwise. That's not quite what we need in here. We're just going to indicate whether or not an event happens. So I'm going to let A be an event, you know, in probability we're stuffing socks and drawers and marbles and urns and we define some event. And then I'm going to let I sub A, so not writing it as a function of X, be one if the event A happens and zero. Uh, otherwise, if, if the event A does not happen. The same idea as indicator with a function, but this one is not a function of some argument X. Okay, so an example, uh, what we're going to see a lot in Markov chains are indicators like this. The indicator that the chain at time one is equal to the value three. So that's gonna be one if at time one we're at three and zero if at time one we're not at three. And the X ones over here are random variables. So this is, this is a random quantity. You're not sure whether it is one or zero. And so it has a distribution. And because it takes the value zero and one, some of you might recognize that this is going to be a binomial distribution, but I don't even want to go there today. All we're going to need for today is the expected value. So this is a random variable and it's got things like distributions and expectations and variances. So check this out. The expected value of this indicator. This is going to be a really important computation for us. This is a discrete random variable, even if the event being indicated involves continuous random variables, the indicator is still zero or one. So we're gonna take zero times the probability the indicator is zero. And then add one times the probability the indicator is one. And the first term disappears. So we get the probability that the indicator is one. But that indicator is one if and only if the event being indicated happens. So this is equivalent to the probability that x1 is three. And that's always going to happen if you have an indicator of an event that happens or doesn't happen. The expected value of that indicator is the probability of the event happening. So we're gonna use that a lot without writing this all out. <laughs> the expected value of an indicator is a probability. Okay, so uh, where were we? We were talking about transient and recurrent states. Um, so I, I won't write these definitions out again just to save some time, but I'll say them. <laughs> these are states you know, of a Markov chain. So a recurrent state is if you start at it, you will return with probability one eventually, and it might take you a really long time and it might be kind of quick. And a transient state is one that you can escape from with some positive probability into an area of the state space where you can never get back. So you will escape 
never to return to that state again. And we wanted to talk about um, if you started, well, actually, I'm not sure how, if I even got to phrase the question yet. So what we want to talk about is um, if you start at some state I and it is recurrent, how many times do you expect to return to I as the chain runs forever? You probably expect it to be an infinite number of times. And if you're not thinking that, well, if, if you know you are going to return with probability one, so if you look at me in my little box, I'm starting at some state I and I'm doing whatever, and then I return to I, that will happen. And now by the Markov property, since I'm starting at I again, I could just start all over. I will return again with probability one. And I will return again with probability one. You can keep starting over by the Markov property. So for a recurrent state, the expected number of returns is infinite. And when you're talking about returns, that is the word return. You're, you're conditioned on having started there because you can have a recurrent state of a chain that you maybe can never reach if you start somewhere else. That doesn't mean it's not recurrent. So you have to start at it uh, to be able to talk about recurrence. So even if you, you never can get there, you can still decide whether it's recurrent or not. So let me know if that doesn't make sense. But we're on to transient states. Um, what is the expected number of returns there? That is, that number of returns is a random variable. So here's what we're trying to find. For a transient state i, um, what is the expected number of returns, which Implicit, again, means that we're starting at um, I to, to count the returns. And then since we are counting the returns, we're not going to count that initial hit on state I. We are ready to go. We've actually done all the hard work already by talking about this geometric distribution because um, I, can, I can go one further on this and I can tell you the distribution of the number of returns conditioned on starting at state I. So let's set up some notation. I am going to let ti, we defined this to be a couple of things last time. I am going to let it be the minimum overall n greater than or equal to 1 for which xn is i. So this is, you know, if I allowed n to be 0, then I would call this a first hitting time on state i. And if you start the chain at i, you have already hit i. But this is supposed to be returns, so we're allowing ourselves to take one time step, so we don't include n equals zero. Then again, if it's supposed to be a return, then we better have started at i. So this is a return time if we start at i. We need to be in that context, right? So this is the first return time to i, uh, in the bigger parentheses. Um, if we're given that we're starting at i. Otherwise, it's not really a return time. It's just a hitting time that's not including zero. So last time, we used a gi to denote a kind of special probability, which I'm sure you want to call p sub i. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I'm always telling you what you're thinking. I would want to call it p sub i for a probability, but there's just too many p's floating around. So we're going to call it g sub i. And this is the probability uh, starting from some state i that you will return. And will return, that implies that we are talking about finite time. So I guess I can continue to write that in finite time. But let's just write it with our new notation. This is the probability that t sub i is finite, given that we start in state i. And another notation, so this is not like, why is this equal to that, um, is p sub i, t sub i less than infinity. So there's no like, how did you get, get that? Or you know, how do you show? How do you go from here to here? It's just, this is just another way to write this. I prefer the, the full writing it out just so everything's clear, but 
in, in some computations like the one we're going to do right now, um, <laughs> it might just be a little quicker and easier to write it this way. OK, so if i is transient, and that's what we're supposing, so I'm, I'm going off of this. We're talking about a transient i. Then we can say that uh, starting at i, actually, what I'm about to say does not require it to be transient or recurrent. So the probability of at least one return that is g sub i. The probability we will return um, is not saying anything about exactly ones. That that's actually the, the same thing. So the probability of at least one return is g sub i. And if that bothers you, you can actually add that to the definition. The probability starting from i that you will return at least once will return covers return once or twice or all of that. And that's a g sub i. It's to read. OK, so the probability we uh, return at least twice is, so this is something I kind of was already talking about. Um, we're going to use the Markov property here. And if we start at some state i and we wander around, um, this is not the best graph. Uh, this doesn't, this picture does not assume that I hit I just because it's kind of going through I because we've got the discrete time steps. So I don't know if we've hit I yet. Um, but the first, uh, that doesn't look good though. So I'm going to just make it look like this. You wander off and you come back. But in reality, you can go above and below it, just not hitting I, right? You can jump. You know what I mean? Cool. So to return at least twice, you have to return at least once. And so now you're back at i. And now it's really the question is, what is the probability you return at least once starting now? <laughs> and the increments of the Markov chain are independent. Like where I go next does not depend on what happened back here. So the probability of returning at least twice is, I'm going to go back up to the end of the line and the second bullet, is g i squared by v Markov property. It's the independent increment. So it's a GI times a GI. It's multiplying two probabilities. Guess what? The probability of returning at least three times is going to be GI cubed, et cetera. So we wanted the expected number of returns. Let me give that a better name than hashtag returns. I'm going to let n be the number of times the process returns to state i, which is also the number of times the process hits state i at times greater than, you know, I'm not going to write that one. But it's also the number of times we hit state i at times greater than or equal to 1. Um, and then I don't think that's worth writing. OK, so we want to find the expected value of n given that x0 equals i. And our other notation is the expected value of n with a subscript i on the expectation. But I was just saying that we can do better than this. We can actually find the distribution of n if we know where we start the chain. So it's actually a conditional distribution. So we can do better. We're going to find the actual distribution, which is more information than just the expectation. So here I am going to take advantage of my subscript notation. What we wrote in those bullets above, starting at i, so this is the probability starting at i, that the number of returns is greater than or equal to 1. 
That's what I was saying above in the first bullet. What's the probability that we return at least once? In other words, the number of returns is at least one. This is g sub i. And the probability starting from i that the number of returns is at least two, we already said is g sub i squared. We're just saying it in more symbols now. And let me write one more. Probability starting from i that the number of returns is at least three is g sub i cubed and another, et cetera. So n is a discrete random variable, and it can take on the value 0 because we might never return. So let's actually find not these like weird tail probabilities, but actual individual probabilities. So I can say the probability starting from i that n is, say, 0. This is 1 minus the probability in this conditional land that n is greater than or equal to 1, since it can take on the value 0, 1, 2 on up. So I'm just trying to isolate 0. And we already know this is 1 minus g sub i. The probability, again, trying to isolate those individual probabilities with equal signs in there and not inequalities. The probability that we return exactly once, this is the probability, all conditioned on starting at i, that we return at least once. And we can take away the probability starting from i that we return two or more times. So like ruling that out. And this is gi minus gi squared. And if we factor out a gi, we get gi 1 minus gi. Please indulge me for one more line before the dot, dot, dot. The probability that the number of returns is exactly two starting from i is the probability starting from i that the number of returns is greater than or equal to two minus the probability starting from i that the number of returns is greater than or equal to three. And this is gi squared minus gi cubed. And if we factor out the gi squared, we can write it like this. And now I'll do my dot, dot, dot the probability starting from i that the number of returns is equal to some k, where k can be any non-negative integer. This is going to be g i to the k, 1 minus g i. And again, this holds for k equals 0, 1, 2, on up. And this is the geometric distribution. It doesn't look quite right. But what we're seeing here is a geometric distribution, the p is actually in place of the 1 minus gi. And so we can say that, you, you don't, don't write this because I'm going to change it, but like, like you would say n has the distribution geome, um, it doesn't really, is a conditional distribution. So we're going to write n given x0 equals i has the distribution, the geometric distribution, the one that starts from 0, and the p is actually 1 minus g sub i. And because we know that, we know it's expectation. So the expected number of returns, given that we started at i, this is 1 minus p over p, but with the g stuff in, you get g i over 1 minus g i. OK, so that's kind of cool. That's what we wanted to find. Um, and did I say that this, I didn't actually specify that this is uh, a transient state, but the expected number of returns to, for, for a recurrent state is infinite. And this kind of works as well. If i is transient, then gi, the probability of returning to i given you start at i, is less than 1. And that means that this gi over 1 minus gi is finite. The expected number of returns to a transient state is finite. And here is an expression for it. But it actually kind of works uh, for a recurrent state. Uh, when gi is 1, of course, this denominator is 0 and it's undefined. But if you kind of let gi go towards 1 and this denominator go towards 0, the fraction is blowing up. 
So yeah, when you plug in GI equals one, it's undefined, but if you kind of think of the zero in the denominator as making this infinite, we're kind of seeing for a recurrent state, the expected number of returns is infinite. Um, in those cases, the so the GI is always a probability. So this will never be infinite. And if you have a recurrent state, the GI is equal to one. It actually doesn't mean we only recur once because you know we can look at two times infinity. So okay. instead of looking at the number of returns, uh, we're going to have to look at the actual time, and we're going to do that calculation. So. We're going to look at the starting from I, the time to return. Uh, if the state is recurrent, then this is finite with probability one, but the expected value could be either infinite or finite. So it's not quite the same calculation. The, the G will be one, though, for a recurrent state. So yeah, um, we're going to actually define that by the end today. Let me get that out of there. We have the concept of recurrence and transience kind of in our heads nicely, I think, you know, like I will return or I may escape never to return again. Um, but the formal definitions are involved that GI probability. Is it equal to one or is it less than one? And that is not always something that's easy to find for every Markov chain. So in my next theorem, I'm going to give you an alternative characterization of recurrence or transience that I don't know if it's more useful. I use them about equ equally. Uh, sometimes I want to, when I want to show something is recurrent, I'll, I'll show that GI is one. And sometimes I'll use this theorem. I use them about the same amount of time. So if I wasn't so lazy, I'm, I'm uh, let me just stop being lazy. It's not that I'm lazy. I just, I hate the dead air while I'm writing. So the alternative, but I don't use slides because I just think that's really it's just like I don't know I can't I can't pay attention to slides. Um, so an alternative characterization of recurrence or transience is in this theorem. And it goes a little something like this. State I is recurrent if and only if, we're gonna look at the sum as N goes from one to infinity of the probability of going from I to I in N steps, if this sum is infinite. I'll talk about maybe an interpretation or the fact that it's not easy to interpret what that is after I just write the next line, and that is equivalently, I is transient if that sum is finite. So what does this sum represent? I'm, I'm not sure, because there is a lot of overlap in these terms. The probability you go from I to I in, say, five steps, that is simply the probability you start at I and five steps later you are in I, and that does not preclude you having been at I before that. So it's not like the time of the first return. It's, there's a lot of overlap to go from I to I in five steps. You, you might go from I to I to J to K to I to I. I don't know if that was five, but you may have hit I several times. And so we're not talking about a bunch of disjoint events. There's lots of overlap in these terms. So I don't think that this sum has the greatest interpretation, but I do think that it's easy to remember which one is which in terms of which one is infinite and which one is finite. If it's recurrent, the probability you come back is kind of large. And so this sum, if you know that one of these diverges and one converges, the sum is gonna diverge, oops, the sum is gonna diverge in the recurrent case because that's when the probabilities are kind of large. And in the transient case, the probabilities are small, er, and eventually, as n gets large, all of those probabilities are zero. You eventually never return again. So for a transient state, um, if you were to look at all of these probabilities in a sequence over n, n equals one, two, three on up, eventually, 
it's going to zero out. We're going to prove it, and it's not really it's not hard at all. Um, but does this make sense? Are there any is there anything I can clear up? Yeah, um, so it we can, it, because yeah, the probability going from i to i in zero steps is always one. So if you add that to infinity, it's still infinite. And if you add that to something finite, it's still finite. So you, you can, um, yeah, I don't know why I don't do that. <laughs> you absolutely can do that. You ready to prove this? Let's do it. I'm going to prove it in the transient case. And then the other one is proved because a state is either recurrent or transient. Um, can't be both and it can't be neither. You'll notice in your current homework that came out, homework two that came out today, I am asking you if a Markov chain is recurrent or transient. Um, uh, we're going to talk about today, but these are class properties. And so if you have an irreducible Markov chain where everything communicates, everything is either recurrent or transient. And if everything is recurrent or everything is transient, we call the entire chain recurrent or transient. But for the entire chain, if it breaks up into classes, some of which are recurrent, some of which are transient, then we can't say the entire train chain. We can't say the entire chain is recurrent or transient. So I do say in the homework, is this Markov chain recurrent or transient or neither? That can happen for the entire chain, but it is not going to happen for a state. So again, when we prove one of these statements, we'll have the other one. OK, we're talking about um, excursions from, what am I trying to show here? I'm going to show the transient case. So I'm going to let, imagine we start a chain. I'm going to let x0 be i, where i is transient. And I'm going to let n be what just what it was before, the number of returns to i at times greater than or equal to 1, so not hitting times, because we hit it once, and we only want to count if we come back. And check this out. If i is transient, which is our assumption here, this happens if and only if the g sub i, the probability of returning in finite time, is less than 1. That is the definition. And if this is less than 1, well, that will happen if and only if the expression g i over 1 minus g i is finite. And where did that expression come from? This is the expected number of returns, so the expected value of n given x0 is i. And we're almost done. Well, yeah, I mean, we are. But um, there's some few things to be said about this next one line, or maybe two lines. So if i is transient, we have this expectation must be finite. I'm going to start with that, but kind of in reverse. So infinity is greater than this expectation. And I want to rewrite n as I want to get those PII super n in there. You know, the, the PII super n, those are probabilities of moving from i to i in n steps. I really want to get like the x's in there. So I am going to write this n as the sum as n goes from 1, actually 1 is important here, not starting from 0, to infinity of the indicator that x sub n, the chain at time n, is equal to i, given x0 is i. Oops, that's a square bracket. So over on the left, I've got n, which is the expected number of times we hit state i at times greater than or equal to 1. And then in here, I'm basically going through the Markov chain, starting at time 1. So this one is important that we start the sum at time 1. And I'm saying, did we hit i? Yes or no. Did we hit i, yes or no? And I'm putting a 1 down every time we do and a 0 every time we don't. So when you add them, that's how you can get the number of returns. OK, I am going to interchange the expectation and the sum. I did just say, um, don't worry about justifying it in this class. But the expectation is 
its own sum. So we're interchanging sums and the expectation is potentially also an infinite sum. And technically I am using Fubini's theorem here, if you care. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about what I just said, but this is an application of Fubini's theorem. Um, okay, so yeah, maybe we write the indicator. But here is an expected value of an indicator. It happens to be in conditional land, but that doesn't change what we saw at the beginning. The expected value of an indicator is a probability of the event happening. It just happens to be in conditional land. So this is the sum from one to infinity of the probability that xn is i in conditional land where x0 is i. That's the probability of going from i to i in n units of time. So this is the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the probability of going from i to i in n time steps. We started with a transient state and we got that this sum was finite and that's what we wanted to show. So we are done. End of my proof. Am I gonna ask you to do this particular proof? Probably not, but this trick I think is something you might have to do in a future computation. <laughs> so a lot of these proofs are good just for like individual like lines, you know, tools, like why is this equal to this more so than like knowing how to prove the result, which is a bonus. Okay. All right. So um, I have been saying that recurrence and transients are class properties. And that means that if you have a class, so we talked last time about reducing the states of a Markov chain, reducing the state space into different classes. And if we had a state that communicated with another state, they went into the same class. Uh, yeah, um, Fubini's theorem says that you can do this interchange if the, if the sum here with absolute values here is finite. And the sum there with absolute values um, is finite because when you take the absolute value of an indicator, it's still just the indicator. And this is equal to this, which is finite. Yeah, it would be, it would make more sense if I wrote it down. But um, yeah, if the thing is absolutely summable. Okay, so yeah, recurrence and transients are class properties. This means that you're running around the space and if all states do not communicate, then you can break it up into some classes. And I think it, I think the transients part makes a lot of sense because I don't know exactly what the class was, but we had something in an example last time where we had like all states in a class and they were transient. <laughs> And maybe this wasn't it, I know for sure. I think the four was the other one. Um, but you can move between classes, but that means you can't necessarily, or that means you definitely cannot move back or they would have communicated. And so starting from say state three, you can get anywhere else, but you will eventually get kicked out of this class, never to return again. Um, and so that, makes it highly believable to me that recurrence and or that transients is a class property because if six is also in the class, then six can go to three. And from three, if we assume that one was transient, we know we'll get kicked out forever. So I don't think it's surprising that transients is a class property, but how could we say this formally? And what if it is surprising to you? So how can we prove that recurrence and transients are class properties? And I will remind you when I write this theorem of what that means. So theorem and transients are class properties from those communication classes, i.e. if i is recurrent, and I communicates with J, we can get back and forth in some number of steps, then J is recurrent. 
and I could replace both of those instances of the word recurrent with transients. In that example I was talking about, when we had the little, we actually had communication classes 0, 2, and 1, 3, 4, 5, 6 in our example. And these were recurrent states, and these were transient states. And the recurrent states we had as part of our matrix, if you just sort of pulled out the 0, 2 part of the matrix, we had like a number here and a number here and a number here and a number here. And I don't know if it's crystal clear that a state like state zero is recurrent, especially if you make these really extreme. Like if this is 0 0.001 and this is 0.999 and this is 0.9, no, that's 0 0.01. If you make it really extreme so that starting at state zero, you will most likely go to state two and starting at state two, you will most likely stay there. Like, are you going to come back to state zero with probability one if you make these really extreme? And the answer is yes, and that might just make perfect sense to you. But if it doesn't, let's prove it. <laughs> OK, so recurrence and transients are class properties. Let's do the proof. I'm going to do it in the recurrent case. And I'm going to use our fabulous new characterization for recurrence. And that is, I'm going to look at that sum of the PII super n. And we want to show that it is infinite. So actually, I want to start with, I'm going to let I be a recurrent state. And suppose that I can get from I to J, or they communicate. So the double arrow. Um, we're going to show in this proof that the sum as n goes from one to infinity of PII super, I'm sorry, PJJ. We want to show something about J. So PJJ super n. I want to show, if I'm trying to show that J is recurrent, I want to show that this is infinite. That will imply that J is recurrent. So that's the goal. And we do know. Um, we know already that uh, the sum with the i i in there is infinite since i is recurrent. OK, so how can we get the infinite sum for the j? Um, I want to use, we should probably use the communication. So. I communicates with J implies um, there exists. I'm going to start being a little more mathy. So that backwards capital E is there. It means there exists integers, positive integers, N and M such that. So my S period, T period is such that I can go from I to J in N steps with some positive probability and I can go from J to I in M steps with some positive probability. That's the definition of communication. So let's consider going from J to J in some, I want to change out, I want to change those um, superscripts because I am going to be running my sum over n, so I kind of don't want to use an n. Um, I want to make the, sorry about that. I am going to get a color here. I'm going to make the first subscript m and the second one k, just to remove the n. And let's look at the probability of going from j to j in n plus M plus K steps. So I claim that this is greater than or equal to the probability of going from J to I in K steps. I'm going to use all the probabilities that we have here <laughs> that are positive. And then I'm going to go from, 
sorry, I to I in N steps, I to I in N steps. And then I'm going to go from I to J in M steps. I already know these two are positive. And this inequality here could be attributed to a generalization. I, I wouldn't make it this difficult, but it could be attributed to a generalization of the chapman kolmogorov equations. And that's actually a problem on the current homework. The chapman kolmogorov equations with three terms in them, you really just have to follow the original proof and condition on two different time steps as opposed to one time step. Um, but without having to appeal to chapman kolmogorov um, I know that because I is recurrent, I will eventually come back. So there is some N for which this is positive. I don't really care about that. But to go from J to J in N plus M plus K steps is possible with some positive probability. Um, there are many ways to do it, but one way is to go to I in the first K steps and then return to I in N steps and then go from I to J in the remaining M steps. And there's probably many, many more ways to go from J to J in this many time steps. So this is just one, and that's why it's not the whole probability, but something smaller. So I want to show that J is recurrent. Let's sum over all N from one to infinity, P, J, J, super N plus M plus K. That's greater than or equal to the sum as N goes from one to infinity of what I have written here. And I'm going to pull out the stuff that doesn't depend on n. So p j i super k, p i j super m, and then the sum as n goes from one to infinity of p i i super n. But because i was recurrent, we know that this sum is infinite. And because of the communication and we chose a K and M so that these were positive, I don't have anything weird going on here like zero times infinity. <laughs> this whole thing is infinite. So the sum I have on the left side is greater than or equal to infinity. So I can say that it's equal to infinity, but the sum is just not quite right. So let's like re-index it. First, I'm just going to rewrite it. N plus M plus K. This is infinite. To get it to look right, because this is not, sorry about the scroll, but I'm going to go back up. I'm trying to show something like this, the entire sum, and I have something close to that. I am going to re-index this and say that this is the sum as L goes from, so I'm going to let L be the stuff up there. So L goes from, what am I trying to say? First index is M plus K plus one. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. M plus K plus one to infinity of P sub JJ super L. This sum is the same as this. I've just re-indexed it. Those are totally equal. And that's a tail of a sum. These are, this, these are totally equal. And if that tail of the sum without all the terms is infinite, then adding more terms that are pop probabilities, they could all be zero, but still infinite. So this implies that the sum as L goes from one to infinity of P J J super L is infinite. And that implies that J is recurrent. And that's what we were trying to show. I don't know if you remember, but we were trying to show that recurrence was a class property. So we started with I recurrent and J something that communicates with I. And we proved that J must be recurrent. So we're done. That was kind of fun. And definitely a good use of our alternative characterization of recurrence. Okay, we're going to look at um, some more examples of recurrence and transients. We had a couple of like 
little state spaces and probability transition matrices, but we're going to look at something that's really important in stochastic processes, something we're going to come back to several times, and that is the concept of a random walk. So this is kind of a big example, but it's more than that. It's introducing the random walk. I'm going to call this uh, random walk on integers, all integers, positive and negative. And if you wrote this, it's not, it's not that well defined. There are variations. So here's how I'm going to define it. This is not how I define it and other people define it differently. This is a random walk. There are more than one kinds of things I can write here and call it a random walk. So we're on all the integers, positive, negative, zero. At each time step, we're going to, the process can possibly go up by one with some probability p or go down by one with some probability one minus p. It can't stay flat and it can't jump further. So we'll go up by one with some probability p. P actually could be zero or one, but this is a number between zero and one inclusive or down by one with probability one minus P. So between zero and one. If we assume for the moment, Actually, let's keep assuming it. So what happens if I want to talk about whether or not this chain is irreducible and if it's irreducible. So if P is between, let's just, sorry, I'm going to assume it's between zero and one for the moment. If it's between zero and one, all states communicate. This, this chain doesn't have to start at zero. It could start anywhere. But if you imagine it's starting at zero at each time step, it can either go up by one or down by one. And it's just going to move around and maybe go down here. That's an awful path. Um, but it's kind of hope easy to see that all, all states communicate if P is between 0 and 1. It may be really, really hard to get between some states because this can wander off to infinity. But assuming that um, P is between 0 and 1, then all states communicate. And so keeping with this assumption that P is between 0 and 1, we now know that uh, all states are either recurrent or transient because it's a class property. And if all states communicate, there's only one class. Wait, let me put that up here. One class. So all states are either recurrent or all states are transient. And if all states are one or the other, that means the we can say the entire chain is recurrent or transient. We start to give name, we start to put these names from states to the entire chain. So the chain is recurrent or transient. And so if we want to figure out whether or not this chain is recurrent or transient, and I think it's going to change depending on the value of P, let's, let's not talk about those edge cases right now, because those are, I think, well, we can, it's going to be transient for sure. If P is one, it's just always going up. So when you leave a state, you'll never return again. Um, and if it's always going down, when you leave a state, you're never going to return again. So transient in those cases. Um, but what's going on for the other P's between zero and one? And is there a subgroup of P's for which this is recurrent or transient? And the intuition should tell you that if, if P is greater than, I'm not gonna draw this. If P is greater than one half, this is gonna drift upwards. And if P is less than one half, it's gonna drift downwards. And if it's gonna be transient anywhere, it's probably those P's. And if P is equal to one half, maybe this has a chance of being recurrent, but it's still difficult because if you start at say zero and it's P is one half, you're equally likely to go up and down. And there's a good chance of seeing a few ups in a row. And then once you're up above zero, you're equally likely to go up or down. So when you get away from zero or any other state, 
then the equally likely to go up or down sort of keeps you away. Uh, and so you might think it's hard to get back even when you're equally likely, even when P is one half. This is gonna be our first example of uh, recurrent, but an infinite return time expected. I said those words in the wrong order, but it can, still kind of worked. Okay, um, to do that, let's look at state zero because all states are the same. So we'll look at state zero. If it's recurrent, all states are. If it's transient, all states are. Um, and we're gonna check whether the sum as n goes from one to infinity of p zero zero in n steps is infinite or finite. So the first order of business is writing out an expression for that p zero zero. One thing I can say is for n equals one, two, three, it's not happening. Um, if you start at zero, the way this chain was described, you cannot stay. So you have to go up or you have to go down. So you definitely can't be at zero at time one. Um, but basically to get back, you need an equal number of steps up or down. And so you actually can't get back to zero in an odd number of steps. It has to be an even number of steps. So half of them go up and half of them come down. So for these n, the probability of going from zero to zero in n steps is actually zero. What I wanted to say, I'll write on the next line. I guess what I meant to say, so odd numbers, no, i.e. for n equals one, two, three, four, etc. We can represent an odd number as the index like 2n plus 1. That's what I meant. Uh, that's always 0. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. So what happens if we have an even number? I'm going to go straight to that. Um, the probability we go from 0 to 0 in 2n steps as n is 1, 2, 3 on up. That covers all the even numbers. This is going to be. Um, it's given by the binomial distribution. So I don't know, I don't have time to review that one today, but hopefully you know the binomial distribution. If we call going up a success and going down a failure, then we're going up with probability P, success probability P, failure probability one minus P. And to come back to zero and two N steps, we need to choose exactly N of those steps to go up and the rest to go down. So up is success and down is failure. And so this is a binomial type probability out of two N, we have to choose N successes and we get the success probability to the nth power and the failure probability to the nth power, which is two N minus N. Binomial distribution, success up, failure down or the other way. So sorry about not reviewing the binomial. But um, yeah, I think we're kind of ready to consider the sum. So if we look at the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of p0, 0, 0 super n, that runs over even at odd numbers, and a whole bunch of them are 0. Every other one of them is 0. But th that means this is the same as the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of p0, 0, 0 2 n because that will just pick up the even ones. So between those two, I've dropped the odd indices. And now I have an expression for that. This is the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 2 n choose n p to the n 1 minus p to the n. I am out of time. This is where figuring out whether this converges or not is where Sterling's approximation is going to come in. I don't know if you all saw it, but I made an announcement today about uh, a handout describing Sterling's approximation. You don't have to read it. I was just going to state it, though, and not prove it. And for anyone that cares, it's there. But we're going to pick up next time. We're going to figure out if this converges or not. We're going to use a limit comparison test. It's going to be awesome. Please come back. I will see you next time on Markov Processes.